to talk about what happens when God, and today we're going to be talking about what happens when God is silent. This whole month, I'm going to be introducing you to people who loved God, good people. They did the right things, but somehow, God, every evidence was that in their lives, he was Mteja. He was not available for them. And I want to say this as I begin this series, that this series is not abstract for me. I'm not sharing things that are abstract. I've struggled with some of the things I'm going to be teaching. The things that me and my wife, Carol, have struggled with, and we've prayed, and we've trusted God, and we've fasted, and we've said, Father, we are serving you. We are on the front line for you, and we've expected God to come through, and he should have come through, and he didn't. And there are different examples. One of the examples that it's interesting, we're just talking about it this morning with my wife, is that for years, for years, we trusted God for a child. I mean, we were in ministry, we were serving God, we, in fact, let me tell you even what made it even more, more ridiculous, is because somehow at that season, I found that it's almost like God gave me the ability to pray for people who, had, who didn't have children, and they would have babies. And so people are coming to church, and I'm praying for them, and a little while later, somebody's coming with a bulge, pastor! <laughs> And you're like, praise God, God is so good. And another few months later, she's coming with a baby. Pray for my baby, Dedicate. By the way, even till today, I still know some of those ladies who, it's such a special, we have such a special bond because I prayed for that baby before they were born, they came. And at the same time, my wife and I are asking God, God, why us? Why haven't you given us a child? And we fasted and prayed. By the way, we did everything we could. Some of you have gone through that journey. You know how difficult it can be. We saw every physician you can think of. In fact, one of the things that God did, he took us through all kinds of places. And we got prodded and pried and tested and whatever, and none of the doctors could give us an answer. And I kept asking God, why? Why would you do this to me when I'm serving you? Why would you do this to me <laughs> when there are children in high school, dropping out of school, getting babies that they don't even want? And you can't even bless your servant. And so I want to bring you back to God's word this month. And the word I'm going to be sharing with you, it's very personal for me. The stories of great people who loved God, who served God, and somehow things didn't work out for them, but somehow God was still God in their lives, and I believe that their story encourages me, and it's going to encourage every single one of you. And today I want to start with a story of a man in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 3 to 6. The title of my message today is When God is Silent. Matthew 11, 3 to 6. And as you turn there, <laughs> as we start to look at this, as we dive into this series, let me give you a little context to the passage. It's an important passage. And one of the things I always tell you is you need to understand the context of the passage you're reading in the Bible. And nowadays, by the way, because you don't even need, you know, before pastors had big concordances and big books with information, nowadays all this information is available on Google. Google is your friend, as they said. Wikipedia has all this information. So when you're reading the book of John, when you're reading whatever book you're reading, you, you can actually go and find out more about the person you read about. Are they a historical figure? What is told about them uh, out, out there? And you can get some context that helps you understand the stories in Scripture. So I'll give you a little context for this story. This story begins with Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the king of Palestine imposed by the Romans in the early life of Jesus, in the first very few years of Jesus' life. Herod wasn't called the Great because he was a great guy. <laughs> On the contrary. The reason he was called the Great is because of some of the huge developments that he did. He was a phenomenal builder. And he did huge constructions. He built buildings and aqueducts and many other things. I've had the privilege of seeing some of the things he put up. They're still, to, they're still useful today. And you'd be shocked because this is a couple of thousand years later. He was a phenomenal builder. But Herod was a terrible man. He was an awful guy. I mean, this guy, <laughs> he married se several wives, killed at least two of them that are known, killed his own children, at least two children that are known. And who does this? He killed one of his mothers-in-law. 
I mean, who kills their mother-in-law? Okay, some of you are looking at me suspiciously, but <laughs> I mean, this guy was horrible. I mean, you read the Bible and you read the story of Jesus' birth. This is the same Herod who was so insecure that when he heard from prophecy that a king was going to be born, a young boy who would become a king one day and he had been born in Bethlehem, what did he do? He sent his soldiers and they killed all the boys below two years old in Bethlehem. This was a ruthless, bloodthirsty leader. He's so terrible that history tells us that when the time came for him to die, that he was so angry that he was dying, that he rounded up all the leading citizens of his kingdom. All of them were rounded up in one city called Jericho. And he gave the order, the minute I die, kill all of them. He said, why should it be my family only that's mourning? Let everybody mourn. I mean, this guy, he was something else. Now, fortunately, what happened is when he died, the people he gave the order changed the order. So what happened, actually, what he didn't want happened, what he didn't want is what happened, because when he died, everybody's life was spared and there was a big party. So it's like people celebrated when he died, the opposite of what he wanted. But he was a terrible guy. So anyway, he dies, and the Romans came. The people who were really in charge, they came, and they took his kingdom. Caesar Augustus was the, 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 the emperor of Rome at that time. He split the kingdom into two, Palestine into two. He gave the lower part of the kingdom to one of his sons, Herod's sons, called Achilles. And then the northern part, he split that into two other parts. And he gave one part to, Her uh, to Antipas, one of the sons called Antipas, and another son called Philip. So I think there's a little map there, but I think it's a little... Well, let, let's not use that one. It's not, it doesn't have the level of detail I need. So, the top, so think of the, two, the top kingdom, Antipas, and on the eastern side, there's Philip. The bottom side, he's given Achilles. Now, the soap opera begins then. By the way, do you know the Bible has more drama than a soap opera? Uh, because the soap opera begins right after that. I mean, this guy called uh, Philip, he marries his niece. I mean, their niece, because they are three, they are, they are three brothers. Marries their niece, who's a very, very beautiful woman. Her name is Herodias. And so he marries Herodias. They have a daughter, a very beautiful daughter, called Salome. And then guess what? His brother, uh, Antipas, lives on, the, on this other side, comes to visit. He's on the western side, comes to visit him. And when he comes to visit, he brings gifts. He leaves with a wife. Because what he does, he sees his brother's wife, falls in love with her, and elopes with her. How's that for drama? I mean, he steals his brother's wife. And not only the wife, he takes the daughter as well. So Salome goes with the mom. And this guy goes home with a bride. He leaves his brother broken, divorced, and he comes home with a wife. And this is the kind of drama the Herods had. Now, everything seems to be going well for her, for Herodias, and for her new husband, Antipas. But for one thing, and this is the next character in our story, his name is John the Baptist. He's actually the main character of our story today. John the Baptist was a special kind of guy. He was a fearless influencer. He was a kind of guy who did not fear anyone. And as a result, John had become very popular with the regular people. Because even power did not intimidate him. When he saw somebody who was to at the top doing the wrong thing, John spoke out. He was an activist. And so John saw this thing. He knew it was sinful. He knew it was wrong. And he began to preach against it. And at that point, as he was doing his duty, speaking against what he should have been speaking against, Herodias was so angry, the wife, that she told her husband, you must arrest this guy or kill him. The Bible tells us, because the Bible has this story, and you can read it for yourself. The Bible tells us that Herod was not into killing John. Because he feared the people liked John, but he also knew John was a holy man. And so he did his best to protect John. But eventually he had to listen to his wife. And he arrested John and put him in jail. So here John was doing the right thing, and now he was in jail. And Herodias was convinced that she was going to kill him do everything she could to kill him. So, so, so even at this point, think about it. You're in that situation. Some of you found yourself in that situation where you're doing the right thing. You're trying to honor God. You're trying to carry out your calling. That's what John was doing. And then, boom, the guy is in prison. So here is a place then that we get to our story. John is in prison in a place where he needs divine intervention, has been faithful to God. Now he's in trouble, calling out for, to God for help. And God does exactly nothing. In his prison cell, John can hear what Jesus is doing. Jesus is going around healing people. Jesus is going around setting people from de free from demons. Jesus is going around doing all kinds of things for other people. But nothing.
for the one man who came to prepare the way for him. This was what John's mission was. John prepared the way for Jesus. John preached about Jesus. John made the way clear for Jesus so people could accept Jesus. And he's not doing anything for him. To make things worse, John is Jesus' cousin. And at that point in prison, understandably so, John begins to doubt. And John calls some of his friends together. Some friends have come to visit him in prison, some of his disciples. And he says, I want you to go to Jesus and I want you to ask him this question. So let's read from Matthew chapter 11. That's a context for our story. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. And we're going to read till verse 6. I'll make a few, po- a few interjections in the middle. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, now, let me pause a minute. Because I think at that point, John's disciples probably paused in the story and said, wait a minute. Are you sure you want us to ask that question? John, you're the one who's been teaching us about Jesus. Remember, that's what John had been doing. You're the one who's told us he's the one who is coming from God. You're the one who came to prepare a way for him. You're the one who told us that he must become greater and you must become less. How can you then tell us to ask him whether he's the one? Does that mean you don't even know what you've been teaching us? You know, it's very interesting. I think as I read that first two verses, and I have to make this comment, it's so interesting how our faith in God often depends on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Have you noticed that? Some of you at the beginning of this message, you said, I had a, I've had a fantastic year. I've had an incredible year. My business is going well. My relationship is going well. I got married this year. Things are happening for me. And you know, most of the time when that's, our, when that's our story, when that's your testimony, for most of us, we're like, God is with me. God loves me. I'm walking with God. God I have favor with God. There are some of you who say today, I've had the hardest year of my life. And many times when we're in that situation, what do we think? We think, I feel like God has left me. I feel like God no longer cares. I feel like God doesn't hear my prayers nowadays. I feel like God has just sort of left me and moved on to other things. You see, God didn't change, but our circumstances changed. And when our circumstances changed, our view of God changes. And that's where John is. He's saying, are you the one? Are you the one who was to come? And you know, God hasn't changed. God hasn't become different. But for John, it almost seems like God has shrunk down to the walls, the size of the walls of his cell. God has become small because of John's situation. So here is Jesus' answer. And by the way, let me say this. Jesus' answer is extremely important for us. Why? Because I believe it's a word for every single one of us who has ever found ourselves in this situation or will find ourselves in this situation in the future. Jesus says, Jesus replied to John the Baptist, verse 4. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. In other words, he's saying, because John can't see beyond the walls of his prison cells, because God's John, uh, John's God has shrunk to the size of his prison cell, go and tell John what God is doing outside the prison cell. He says there are things, big things that God is doing. Go and report these things to John. And he says, verse 5, the blind receive sight, the lame are walking, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He says, go and tell John these things. And then he says, finally, the one other thing you want to tell him is blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, I kind of suspect this was not the answer John was expecting. I think that John was probably expecting when he sends the disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? That Jesus will say, go tell John, I'm the one and I'm coming to break him out of prison. That's probably what he was expecting, a prison break, isn't it? I even suspect that, by the way, that question, are you the one, was not really a question. It was an expectation. That John was really saying to Jesus, if you are the one, while you are out there saving the whole world, while you are out there helping everybody else, I am still here. But have you ever prayed a prayer like that? 
God, while you are there saving all the children of Bosnia, and you're holding up the, the nations of the world, I'm still here. My situation hasn't changed. I'm your servant. Look at me. And this is what John seems to be telling Jesus. Here, here's why I am. But the interesting thing for me is what Jesus then replies. Because Jesus doesn't reply the way John is expecting. What does Jesus, what does Jesus do? He points John to what God is doing outside the prison cell. And he's basically saying, your mission was to prepare the way for Jesus, was to prepare the way for me. Now look at what God is doing through me. Look at the great things that God is doing. Your mission is still there. Your purpose hasn't changed, even though your circumstances may not seem to be working. God's plan for you is still intact. God hasn't forgotten you. It's still important what you came to do. And I sense that God, Jesus is telling him, look beyond your prison cells, because God is much greater than your circumstances. And there's a very important thing that God asks him here. I really believe, by the way, when I read this, huh, I saw a question here in this text that I believe is God's question to many of us today. <laughs> Not just those who are going through a difficult time, but for every single one of us who claims to follow God or who wants to follow God. And this is a question. Will you trust God's plan or will you make a God to fit your plans? I think that's what God is really asking, John. <laughs> will you trust God's plan, even though you don't understand it? Will you trust God's plan? Or will you make your own God? Will you make a God to fit your plan? I'm going to explain what that means. You see, the problem is it's very unfortunate that when we face a difficult situation, we shrink God to the size of our situation. We shrink God to the size of our prison cell. Like John the Baptist, all we can see are the four walls of our cell. All we can see are the, the things that constrain us. And we begin to put God in that situation. We see him as small as the walls of our cell. And we begin to reach certain conclusions. My goodness, maybe God has abandoned me. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God doesn't exist. But you know what God tells John? God says, look at the big picture. My purpose is still being carried out. You're part of that purpose, and your purpose is still valid. God still cares for you. God has not forgotten you, even though your situation is not working out the way you want. And the question he's asking is, will you trust God's plan, or will you make a God to fit your plans? You know, this is a truth that many of us don't want to hear. We don't like to hear this truth. To be honest, I don't like to hear it. I'd rather have a God who comes through when he's supposed to come through, on cue. You know what I'm talking about? You pray a certain way, you wait a certain time, but you know he's going to come through. I'd, I'd rather have that. I'd rather have a God who sort of fits a certain pattern, a predictable God. That's one of the things I, I, I don't like about this truth, because I, I prefer God to be predictable, to fit into what I want him to be. But you know, the interesting thing is that God is sovereign. And what this word means is that he's in charge. And God's sovereignty means that he can dictate the circumstances <laughs> to fit my desires. He can. Because of my desires, he can dictate the circumstances to fit my desires. But there are times when he can overrule my desires to create other circumstances. That's what a God, a real God does. And for God to be God, then he has to have the authority to dictate how things turn out. You know, one of the things that he asks John is, will you let your faith stumble? Will you let your faith stumble because things aren't working the way you think they should be working? Now, I just sense I need to say something about this. You know, the church today, and we pastors, I think sometimes we fail you as God's people because of the way we teach about Christianity. I think we teach a Christianity that's not very biblical. We teach a Christianity that is almost, I'd say today there's almost like a spiritual Christianized witchcraft that is taught by the church. You know why I say that? Because witchcraft, you know how witchcraft works, isn't it? You carry out a certain prescribed set of actions 
and you get a certain prescribed result. Isn't that witchcraft? Stop looking at me like you don't know what a witch doctor does. Isn't that what witch doctors do? You go, you take certain entrails, you wrap them around your waist, you have an amulet, you put it on, and what happens? All evil spirits, they go. It's guaranteed. You do this action, you get that reaction. That's how witchcraft works. And many times pastors have taught people a Christianity that is almost a divine, a spiritualized kind of witchcraft, a Christianized witchcraft. Where we're saying, you know, pray this way. Pray this way and this result will happen. Do this thing in this way. Fast in this way. Give your tithe envelope in this way. Send this number to the Mpesa. And what will happen? All your situations will change. Because why? God will be constrained to act because of that action. It's almost like a God of our own creation. You know, we have an interesting anthem. Our, anthem, our national anthem says, Oh God of all creation. But I think many times Christians, we serve the God of our creation. Oh God of my creation. God who I've made to do what I want. When I press the button, he always comes through. This is a kind of God that sometimes we've taught in the church. We make a God who fits our plans. But you know, it's such an easy thing to have an event-based faith. It's so easy to serve God when things work out the way I want. But I sense that Jesus sends John a hard answer. He doesn't send him an, uh, an answer that I find comforting. He doesn't send him an answer that I find easy or even <laughs> one that I receive easily sometimes with joy. He tells him, will you, will you trust God's plan or will you make a God to fit your plans? That's what God is asking today. Now, it's very interesting because Jesus sends John, his disciples back to John and he says, tell John what you see. Tell him what you hear. Tell him what's going on around outside his prison. And I sense that for some of us who are in that difficult situation, by the way, as I speak this message, some of you are in that difficult, challenging situation looking for answers. And I sense that Jesus' question or question back to you would be to, the same as he gave to John. He said, look outside your prison cell. Look outside your circumstances. Look what God has done. Look what God is doing. He's the same God who was there when you called him as a teenager. He's the same God who saved you from being wayward. He's the same God who helped you in your exams. He's the same God who gave you that job. He's the same God who you called and he helped you. He's the same God who saved you in the past. And just because your circumstances are different today doesn't mean that God has changed. God is still on the throne. And he's not a God of your creation. He's a God of heaven and earth. And if you want to serve the God of heaven and earth, you then need to say, do I trust that he has the right to order circumstances the way he chooses to order them? Will you trust God's plan? Or will you make a God to fit your plans? God may be silent, but he's never absent. God may be silent right now, but he's never absent. And you need to decide did I sign up to follow a real God? Or did I sign up to sign up to, to follow a God who I can control, who does things the way I want to do them? This is a hard truth that I sense God shares to John. Now, I wanted to start with a simpler message. I wanted to start with something a little lighter. I wanted to start with something that would bring a little more joy and smiles that I'm seeing right now. I don't start with something that would make you jump up and say, hallelujah, God is going to come through and go with your faith strengthened. But I just sense that God is leading us to a season when we must really have a faith that is based on God and not on our own desires. And that we must move away from a faith that is a, a, a childish faith. You know, childish faith is that faith that is almost like, your, they call them rice Christians. As long as God keeps the rice flowing, I'll keep following. And God is saying, this is not the season for that. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will follow me regardless. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will trust me and choose to trust me, even though the situation doesn't change. I'm looking for sons and daughters like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who says we will follow God. We will honor God, regardless of whether we're thrown in the fire or not. Even if God doesn't save us, still we will serve him. I sense that this is what God is looking for. And he's saying, if you want to follow your own kind of God of your creation, who does your bidding, 
That's not the God of the Bible. But the question God is asking us today, will you trust God's plan or will you make a God who fits your plan? There's a great song by a man named Donnie McClacken. And it says simply that word, I choose to trust you, Lord. I want us to listen to the words of this song. And as the singers sing this song for us, I want us to actually get into a space where we think through. I want you to actually hold the situations in your mind where you've been disappointed by God. Hold those situations in your mind that are not working out the way you've wanted them to work out. If it's an errant child, if it's a habit that you've struggled with, if it's a situation, a marital situation that is not working out, if it's a financial situation that you've had difficulty, whatever place you felt disappointed because God hasn't come through as you expected, I want us to hold on to that. If you could, could you just mentally hold that? Just picture that. Is that okay? Can you picture it? Are you awake? Tell your neighbor, he's talking to you. So just picture that situation, that thing that it is that you're holding on to. Just begin to picture it right now. And as this song is sung, I want you to just put that situation, make these your words, because I sense this is where God is starting us off as we begin this series. I know that faith is easy when everything is going well. But can you still believe in me when your life's a living hell? And when all things around you seem to quickly fade away, Just one thing that I want to know Said, so will you let go? I'll trust you, Lord Will you stand on my word? I'll trust you, Lord Against all laws, will you believe what I said? that I made will you say yes I will trust you Lord mm -hmm. said I know how bad it hurt you when that love was life seemed to come to an end and when they said they had to leave you, you said you'd never love again. But will you trust that I can help you and that I'll never turn away? Said, will you trust me, child? Yeah. 
it's interesting how my story ended out because as much as we prayed, God just never answered our prayer. And we were faced with the disappointment that we would never have children. In fact, it was so interesting the way God did it. Huh? He took us to the States um, as part of other things. We got to make friends. And what some of the friends we made were some of the leading surgeons in the world in the research for infertility. And we got poked and prodded in all the laboratories you can imagine. Places you'd never imagine. We'd never have afforded that by ourselves. And it was so exciting because we were like, wow, God actually loves us so much, he brought us here. What we didn't realize is God loves us so much, he brought us here to tell us no. And all our surgeons told us after they did their, they, they did their stuff on us, they were like, you know what? We can't tell what it is. We can't even tell. There's, no, there's nothing wrong. But somehow it just seems you've been trying for this long, you never will have biological children. It was such a hard time. Eventually, we gave up. And after we prayed, we felt led and we went and we adopted our children. Our three children, some of you don't know that, are all adopted. And we love them. We love them. They're amazing children. In fact, I'm really glad in them. But I've never understood why God allowed us to go through the pain He did. Just this morning, in fact, as I talked to my wife about this, someone, we found ourselves both crying. In fact, we were like, wow. It's not that we're... Where it's just that it brought us back to a space we had been in and we're like that was such a painful space in our lives it's never made sense I've never understood why God took us the route he did but he did and I found ourselves asking answering this question at that time it's almost like God was saying will you choose to trust me if I work things out my way will you choose to trust me even though circumstances don't work out the way you want them to Will you choose to trust me anyway? Even though I bless others and I don't seem to be blessing you in the same way. Will you choose to trust me that I have a good and perfect plan that you don't understand and you may never even understand on this side of eternity? Will you choose to follow me anyway as a pastor and as a man of God? Even though I've disappointed you and I know that I have, will you choose to trust me? I sense that God was asking me that question. And I remember tearfully with my wife, we said, Lord, we will follow you. Lord, we will trust you. Lord, we will serve you. Lord, we will, even if it hurts, even if nothing happens for us, even if you don't come through the way we hoped, even if our lives don't turn out the way you say we thought they would, we will trust you. This is our testimony even today. We trust you, Lord. We follow you, Lord. We will serve you, Lord. Ah, this has been our prayer. And as I share this story, I share it, <laughs> knowing there's some of you who are listening to this and accessing it through pain because you're in a very similar situation right now where you found yourself saying, God, how can I let go of this dream? How can I still love you if you don't do things the way I wanted them to turn out? And I sense that God is saying to you today, choose to trust. Choose to trust. I want to pray as I conclude. This whole month, we're going to be talking about different people and we're going to be learning different lessons. <laughs> and I just sense that God wanted us to start with this first one. That you know, if you don't trust me, if it doesn't start with my sovereignty and my, my ability to lead you, whether I'm leading you the way you want to be led or not, if you can't trust me to lead you, then nothing else makes sense. And I just sense that God wanted me to pray today for people who are in this situation where maybe there's an anger you felt against God. There's a disappointment you're accessing even as you hear God's word. The situation where you felt angry at God or disappointed at God. Some of you have been so disillusioned with God. Maybe you've even learned ways to cope and spiritualize it, but deep down inside, it still hurts. And you have no answers. And I sense that God is saying today, I want you to just stand up and surrender that to me. Surrender that issue. And say, Lord, whether it comes through or not, I will still trust you. Some of you have been praying for a husband for years. And you've gotten to the place where you're saying, God, you owe me this. And I want you to, I, I, I sense God is saying, today is the day you come and say, you know what, Lord, whether or not, you bless me in this way. I will still do it. Some of you have been praying for children. For some of you, it's your financial situation. Some of you, it's your family. Yes, God wants to bless them. But I want you today to listen to God's word who is saying, listen, even if things don't turn out the way you want them, will you still choose to trust me? Those are the people I want to pray for this, morning, this afternoon. But before I pray for you, there's one other group I want to pray for. And I'm going to pray for that group uh, first. And these are the people who, you know what? because of pain, because of disappointment, because of what you saw happen in your life or in the lives of others around you, you haven't followed Jesus. 
Maybe you even knew him a long time ago, but you walked away. You are so disillusioned in your faith and so disappointed that you walked away from him because of the pain you saw, because of the disappointment you felt. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus because of that same disappointment. And today, my goodness, I'm so praying that you will put your hand up and you will say, Lord, I will follow you. Because all of a sudden today, you've understood why you follow God. You don't follow a magic God of your own creation. You don't follow God because he does your bidding. You follow God because he's worthy to be followed. He's sovereign. He's the rock. He's solid. And that's why you follow him. His plans for you will never be altered, depend regardless of the circumstances. And maybe now that you've understood that, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. Because for the first time, I, uh, I feel like I want to give. I, this is a kind of solid faith I want to follow. Not a magical faith that is made up of make-believe stories, but a real faith in a real God who has my back regardless of what happens. And if you're here, I want to pray for you. I'd, I'd be delighted to pray for you today. So I'm going to ask if this is you. You're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to come back to my faith today. Just raise your hand and then put it down again. We'd love to pray for you. It would be such an honor for me to pray for you today. Come on, just raise it up. Put it up in the sky and then put it down again. And you're the first person. I'm going to pray for you and trust God with you. We're going to just thank God with you as you say, Lord, I choose to trust you. I may not have all the answers. It may not make all the sense, but you're worth following and I choose to trust you. Anybody who's here, praise God for you, my sister. I bless God for you. To God be the glory. I see you, my brother, as well. Praise God for you as well. To God be the glory for you. Anybody else, just join them. Put up your hand. This is not about a pastor. You're not following a pastor. You're following a God who is unchangeable. You're following a God who loves regardless of situations. Thank you, my sister. I see you at the back as well. To God be the glory for you. Anybody else? Come on, just join them. You're saying, you know, now finally I get this. This is not a thing made up by pastors or by people. This is a real God. And this is a kind of God who can comfort me even in my challenging times. I want to follow that kind of God. Not a God made up by people, not a magic God, not a witchcraft God, but a real God. This is a kind of faith I want to have. Anybody else would just join those. Anybody just put up your hand and put it down again. That's all I want you to do. And I'd love to pray for you this afternoon. Anybody, I want to give a minute because I sense there are some people here who are really struggling with this. And you've struggled. And maybe you're even reliving the pain right now. But I sense that God is saying, give me that pain. I'm able to heal you. I'm able to put you in that place where you need to be. But you choose to trust me. Will you trust me? This is the most important question in the universe. Will you trust me? And if you're here, just put it up and put it down again because I would love to pray with you. Any brother, any sister here who's saying, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you so much, my sister. I bless God for you. I thank God for you. I bless God for you. You know what? I just sense there's some of us who really, it's not an easy conversation we're having. And as we have it, I, I don't have it lightly with you. But you know, I really sense it's such an essential conversation because this is a conversation about purpose and about what we were created to be and to do. And that as we come, by the way, even if you've not raised your hand today, I want to encourage you to keep coming this month because I sense that God is going to give you some answers you've been looking for for a long time, a long time as we go through this series. And I want to pray for you as we conclude. But let me pray for those who've raised their hands right now. If you just raised your hand and we give thanks for you, just raise it up one more time because I want to pray for you as your hand is raised. Keep it up boldly. Come on, let's appreciate them as their hands are raised. To God be the glory, every single one of them. And I'm going to invite you to say this prayer with your hand raised and you're identifying with Jesus. You're saying, I follow you today. And if you just say this prayer, and those of you who've prayed this prayer before, join them in praying and making this confession. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, come to you today. I come to you today. I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you. Even though my situation may not work out, Even though my situation may not work out. I choose to trust a God, I choose to trust a God. who is rock solid. Is rock solid. I thank you because your plan for me will be fulfilled and I thank you that I follow you from this day forward I belong to you in Jesus name I pray amen oh come on let's appreciate them Avuno. we thank God for every single one of you bless God bless the Lord for every single one if you're sitting next to anybody who raised their hand give them a handshake tell them welcome to the family we're so glad you made that commitment we thank God for you if you made that prayer I'm going to invite you, you might have received a, a, a little slip from one of our ushers. Fill it out and on your way out, give it to one of the guys with an orange t-shirt and we'd be glad to just send you some information this week to help you take those first steps towards trusting God, towards living a life of faith and trust. 
But I also want to pray for those of us who are in this house who, yes, you know God. Yes, you've given your life to Him. But there's been a betrayal, a sense of betrayal you felt that has made you even distant. Yes, you follow God, but you're not sure you always trust Him. Maybe there's been anger. Maybe there's been disappointment. Or maybe you've said, God, you owe me this. You must do this. But today God has challenged you. And you want to say, Lord, I surrender to your will. I will serve you regardless. I won't serve you if. I won't serve you when. I won't serve you because of. Lord, I choose to serve you. I choose to trust you. And if this is you, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet right now. Because I want, as you make this confession, that we will pray before God and release those things. That you can walk the faith that you were created for. Come on, if this is you, stand up wherever you are. Don't even wait for somebody next to you. This is you. God is speaking to you. You know what that situation is you've been holding on to. And you're saying, Lord, I will trust you. I will trust you. Come on, let's appreciate them as they stand. As they enter this space of real faith. Trusting God. Not trusting fiction, but trusting God. Come on, put out your hands in front of yourself. And begin to just give that thing over to God. God, God, I, I commit this to you. I surrender this to you. Whatever it is, Lord, I choose to surrender. Whether things work out or not. Lord, I pray they work out. But even if they don't, I will still trust you. I will still serve you. I will still have joy in you. I will still obey you. I will still represent you. I will still love you all the days of my life. Come on, make this commitment to your God. Father, I thank you for all those who are making this prayer. Some of them are making it in tears. Some of them are making it maybe even with a little fear as they make it. But I thank you because you're inviting us into a space of real faith. Of faith in a real God. Of a God who cannot be shaken. Thank you because you're leading us into a relationship with a real God who enters into a real relationship with real people. And Father God, as we trust you, as we choose to follow you, as we choose not to demand of you to act a certain way, Father God, I pray that you will lead us, that Lord, our lives will be yours, that you will be glorified because of us. I pray for those who are standing in this house, Lord, that people will say of them, oh my goodness, if you, if you in your situation, you choose to trust God anyway, there must be something about this God that is worth following. I pray that, Lord, it will be said of them that these people had a real faith in a real God. And so I thank you for my brothers and my sisters who today are saying, I will trust. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, even this year, testimonies would come out of their life. Lord, <laughs> before even any miracles happen around them, may the miracle happen within them. That, Lord, you would give them a rock-solid faith that is not dependent on circumstances. That, Lord, you'd bless them with the joy of the Lord. I pray for the joy of the Lord to bless them, Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is not dependent on circumstances. It's not like happiness. The joy of the Lord is there regardless of circumstances. And so I pray that even this month, begin to bless them with joy. Let joy overflow in their lives. Let them begin to love you. Give them a hunger and a thirst for you, Lord. Remove hearts of stone. Give hearts of flesh. Give them a, a love for prayer. Give them a love for you, Lord. Not dependent on circumstance. And so, Lord, I bless you. And I thank you for every single one of us. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. And God, people say, it. Amen. Come on, let's give glory to God. Bless you. To God be the glory. You know, I want to conclude our message. And I sense, by the way, that God in heaven is leading us to a new place in our faith. And that he's pleased with this kind of faith. This is, this is what God calls real faith. Because faith is being sure of what we hope for, being certain of what we cannot see. And when you read the, the story in Hebrews about the, the heroes of faith, the Bible says many of them did not even see the things that were promised to them while they were still alive. They saw them later. And God is calling us to a different kind of faith at Mavuno. And I want to bless you today. I want to bless you with a scripture that I really sense God would want us to make our scripture this month. Our reflection this month. And for some of you, I want you to actually note the, in fact, I want you to note the scripture reference. Because this week, in whatever situation you find yourself, I want you to be able to say these words over yourself. Read them over yourself. Maybe even <laughs> memorize them if you can. So that wherever you go, you're able to sing them over yourself. Words that, <laughs> I suspect these words will keep you from being shaken by the storms that come. They'll keep you from being happy when things are working and sad when things are not working. But you will have the joy of the Lord in all situations. 
And these words are in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. Let me turn to it. And Habakkuk was an Old Testament prophet who longed that God would save Israel. He longed that the drought would end. He, he longed that things would work for his country. He prayed and fasted for those things. But finally, he began to understand God and his faith moved to a different level. And his prayer became, not God, I will serve you if... And hear the words that he prays. Are we able to put those on the screen? Because I want us to pray them together. Are you ready to read these words together? Let's read them, guys. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. By the way, let me just put that in context. Agricultural country, every economic value came out of the, the fields and the fruits and the crops and the animals. And he's saying, if things work out, praise God. But even if they don't work out, come on, let's read it again together. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Don't read the other part. That was practice. Are you ready now? Stand to your feet because we're going to bless ourselves with these words. Are you ready to say them? Oh, come on, guys. You need to say these words like we believe them. Are you ready to say these words? Yeah. This is your prayer. This is real faith. As you're walking in this city, this is what allows you to be a fearless influencer. This is not the faith of prosperity gospel. This is not a faith of rice Christians. This is not a faith of God, I will serve you if or when. This is a faith of I trust you, God. Put those words again and let's read them together. This is our benediction, a blessing over ourselves as we end our service. Come on, let's read them together with conviction. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Somebody give glory to the God of heaven. Father, we bless you. We thank you. You are God. You are God. And Lord Jesus, I want to bless your people now as they go out into this week. A people who serve a real God, a God of heaven and earth, a God who can do all things, a God who has all power, a God who is never caught by surprise, a God whose plan and purpose for us will never change, a God who knows our ways and our days. Lord, we choose to trust you. And Father, I speak over your people that as they step out into this week, they will step out in boldness. They will step out in confidence. Not because they have the answers, but because they have the God who knows the answers. And that Lord Jesus, as they walk through this city, Lord, people will see them with a strange boldness. Not a boldness based on magic. Not a boldness based on what's in their pocket. But a boldness based on the God that they serve. And so I speak over you, God's people. May you live such a remarkable faith that your children will be amazed. May you live such a remarkable faith that your workmates will be amazed. May you live such a remarkable faith that God himself will be amazed. I bless you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. To God be the glory. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell them trust. Amen. Trust the Lord.